what what are they uh, what are they referring to? They're referring to a possible announcement that uh, there has been a ancient civilization found under the ice. Apparently, in 1938 and 39, the Nazis had a pretty heavy expedition down to the Antarctic. And when they were down there, they found all of these ancient ruins, which part of, a, part of the ruins they were able to, I guess, cannibalize for their own uses and created bases there and have ever since been looking through the remnants of this ancient civilization, but keeping it secret. When you get into it, when you get into it, it's quite uh, interesting. And you're coming, there's a new information coming out through a Michael Sala uh, article. And it says uh, that through briefing sessions coming to an end, you say that the meetings with Sigmund, we're going to get to who Sigmund is and uh, what his uh, connection to you was. But you're basically, they're saying that there's significant information about Trump in his administration right now to disclose possible the truth about technologies, uh, evidence of secret memorandum issued by Trump says that after taking office in January 20, 2017, he's about to declassify secret patents involving health and free energy technologies. Do you, do you think this is really going to happen? Well, <clears throat> when he initially put out the memo, he received pushback from the civilian intelligence community and the DOD stating that, uh, sure, we will get right on that, but it'll take about 10 years to process. And he fired back, I know I want it released in my first term, which sent chills up the spine of all of these civilian intelligence groups because – they want to keep this stuff hidden. They do not want it to come out because a lot of it is incriminating to them. They've caused a lot of, I guess, crimes against humanity to keep these secrets. He would have the power to basically pardon anybody, whistleblowers, anybody with this information. But you're saying uh, this, this technology is going to take a while to get out to the public. It's not going to happen on – Overnight, and that's what Trump really wanted. I'm surprised that he's, usually Trump gets what he wants, and there's people uh, in charge of things, uh, a higher power than the president himself. Yes, uh, there are 38 levels of secrecy above the president of the United States, and the intelligence communities have refused to brief Trump on the secret space programs and known extraterrestrial life. The, pretty much the same briefing that you would see if you looked up the Reagan diaries and saw the briefing that he supposedly got. They don't trust him. They're afraid that he's just going to tweet it out. Yeah. What are they going to do? I wonder if he just, you know, how he does do his daily tweets and he sometimes goes on his own tangent, it seems. You think they're still going to be able to control a guy like Trump, almost a free will type of person? No, as a matter of fact, they did not want him in office at all. Um, they would make comments such as uh, we would stab him on Inauguration Day if we had to. But apparently the DOD approached the, these intelligence communities and uh, told them that if they did assassinate him that, or if they interfered with any peaceful transition, that uh, they would pull an open coup. He's pretty intimidated, it sounds like, when you hear this kind of information and Wow. How do you think the president himself, is he aware that he's pretty much maybe the 39th person in a, in a classification of need to know? Well, yes, this president definitely knows it. Um, it turns out, you know, he's really, you know, he's been into conspiracy theory for a long time. You know, he talks with Alex Jones, who actually just on the 17th made a, uh, a few remarks about uh, the uh, secret space program that is going on. So um, it, it appears that Trump is well aware of a lot of this, also because of some uh, family ties he, that he has. So he is well aware, and uh, he's also well aware that he's not getting any of the briefings that uh, the other presidents did. You know, uh, yeah, fascinating. And I wonder – if we're going to be, if they're going to be able to hold the big Trumpster down and if maybe he's going to, you know, do it on his own and take a risk, take a risk because he's already been taking a lot of risk. He's on these rallies. He's putting himself out there in the public. So it's quite a uh, interesting. I just hopefully does something soon. Now let's get into this. 
you were recruited through uh, one of the My Lab programs at a young age of six years old. Can you tell me exactly what is My Lab and how would you become a recruited uh, person or a child at the time? Well, My Lab is, I mean, we really need to come up with a better term. It stands for military abductions. And really, My Labs are, you know, if a person is abducted by a non terrestrial and returned, the uh, government will come and abduct them again to be debriefed on what the aliens pick them up for. And then they will be given a screen memory and, and put back in their daily lives. So that's usually what my lab means. It's been used a lot for these programs such as MK Ultra and a lot of the other ultra programs. They lump it in under my lab. But what occurred was I was identified as an intuitive empath through standardized testing in public school. When I was identified as an intuitive empath, they then brought me into a so-called special school pro program that pulled me out of my regular school activities. And you know, once to three times a week, I would be taken on field trips. And these field trips ended up at Carswell Air Force Base or other places similar that uh, um, Air Force personnel, intelligence personnel were at, and they would uh, put us through all types of training and uh, virtual reality scenarios to build personality profiles on us. So they would know whether they wanted to draft us up into the secret space program or just have us work for these, I guess, loosely uh, connected syndicates that we call the cabal or the Illuminati. Yeah, yeah, to say the least. So you did, it wasn't all fun and games. It wasn't you know, we're going on field trips and uh, seeing, going and sightseeing. You're being tested like a pretty much a lab rat. Let me let me ask you this. Let me ask you what what a intuitive. Uh, how would you know if you were an intuitive? What kind of test did you? What was the standard? What what stood out? Intuitive just means you have a very strong intuition about what's about to happen or, you know, what's going on. You have a good intuition and you learn to trust that intuition because it's accurate. Uh, an empath is a person who actually feels other people's feelings and emotion, emotions. So an intuitive empath is a, uh, a hot commodity for these groups because they can be trained to interface with non-terrestrials and, um, Otherwise, it's usually a one-way communication. If you're not an intuitive empath and, and haven't had the training, usually you can have a non-terrestrial communicate with you telepathically, but it's usually a one-way conversation. You were part of a highly classified Air Force space program, which closely uh, cooperates with U.S. Uh, military entities such as the National Recognizance Office and the National uh, Security Agency. Uh, so were you actually a pilot? How did this work? What is actually, no, actually the secret space program? Go ahead. Actually, this was not a, uh, I was not involved in the Air Force program. The Air Force program is what we call the Military Industrial Complex program. And they're usually within 500 miles of near-Earth orbit. And they only have like, you know, a couple space stations that are unknown to us that are around the four or 500 mile mark altitude that they service with TR-3B type craft. And they also have, you know, small bases on the moon. The program I was brought into was called Solar Warden, and it was a Navy program. And it is an interstellar program. They're out traveling throughout our solar system and into other solar systems. I was brought on as an intuitive empath when I was 16, almost 17, just a couple months from my, my birthday, and um, they were going to have me assigned to a research vessel where it was full of uh, scientists and engineers, and I was going to be a specialist or a tech, depending which one of the two I was working for. But when I was first brought there, the captain stated that um, they had a few other people from my program there, and all they did was cry and, and call for mama the first year. So he did not uh, want me on his vessel. So they sent me to another group that was the Intruder Intercept and Interrogation Program. And it's much like the Men in Black. They uh, come down and locate non-terrestrials that are living amongst us, and they will abduct those non-terrestrials and then bring them to a base to interrogate them, to find out why they're here, what their objectives are and agendas are. And I was a part of that for 10 months, almost a year. 
And after that, then I was reassigned back to the research vessel where I, I spent the remainder of the, of the 19 years. Who is this person, Sigmund? He seems like a, he's in charge. Is he in one of the how, – what's his classification on a rank from 1 to 38? And uh, what kind of chemicals do they uh, subject on you? Well, the, um, this particular individual is a high-ranking Air Force uh, personnel. Uh, I, whenever I've met them uh, on their uniform, he does not wear rank insignia or any of the FLIR that would you know, show any designations of what unit he is associated to. But what, how I first was introduced to this gentleman, using that word loosely, um, I was picked up just outside my house by one of these strange vessels that uh, are somewhat triangular, but um, two uh, airmen were standing below it. And they brought me onto the vessel and this, and they began to uh, interrogate me, asking me questions about, uh, you know, about this Navy space program that supposedly existed. And uh, Sigmund was uh, the, the, uh, officer in charge, and uh, they came out and uh, they injected me with uh, chemicals. They chemically interrogated me to a point to where they were holding this tablet below my head. My head was hanging down, and they were going through all these academy-looking photos of military personnel, and there was a camera on this little pad, and whenever I would look at one and recognize a person, it would highlight them, and I inadvertently gave up three naval personnel that uh, were part of the of project solar warden he also took uh, he, he couldn't believe what i was saying he was trying to figure out how i was so accurate about so many things but i was talking about this navy program that he was told didn't exist and he was very upset once he figured out that i was telling the truth he said that he thought his group was the tip of the spear but he found out that they were the effing coast guard when you were a school student, or how did how was your childhood after you know being experimented on? You, you're seeing these things. How were you uh, relating with other uh, children, and uh, were you told not to speak about it? Did you uh, were you compelled to keep your mouth shut? Did you want to tell anybody? How did you just kind of went well, public with out, this stuff not too long ago? It came out. Yeah, yeah, it came out in a. Um, well, I. I was a kid and I had this unexplained PTSD. Um, after each of the training sessions or field trips, they would do what they call blank slating, which was basically a mind wipe. And then they would give you a screen memory. What is interesting is that <clears throat> three to 5% of people that they give screen memories to or do the blank slating on, it doesn't work. Within days or weeks, the memory come flooding back and that's usually with intuitive empaths <clears throat> and what they've what they've come to, to realize is that you know i'll use it terms because i used to be a technician we have this physical hard drive that's our brain and we have memories there but you hear people talk about past life memories how could you have a past life memory on this physical hard drive that's only existed since you've been alive well, it turns out that your higher self acts like a virtual hard drive, and everything that occurs, memories are stored there as well. And some people that are intuitive empaths get an automatic, I guess, backup or download of the information when it's been messed with. Yeah, all of they tried blank slating me um, on the what we call the twenty and back. You serve twenty years, and then they they bring you back, and they. The strangest part is they age regress you to where you were when they drafted you, and then they regress you in time back to the point you were taken. That's pretty bizarre. So, almost a child in an adult's body, would you say, or is that how it works? Well, no. Well, about when I was in 1986, when I was 16 years old, on my Christmas break is when they came and picked me up, and I was drafted into the 20 and back program. I was told that I would serve 20 years in this program. I would come back. I would have the best job around. I, I, I wouldn't want for anything, which that's a promise I didn't keep. And they stated that um, my life would not be that heavily affected because they were going to age regress me and time regress me back to the time that I was taken. 
and that I would pick up where I left off and my family would never notice me missing. Wow. So there's technology for reverse uh, reversing life itself that exists right now that was used upon you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, there's um, uh, William Tompkins is a, is a recent whistleblower that has heavy documentation and works for the Navy and a lot of aerospace companies. And uh, uh, TRW is one of them, and they have had uh, telomere types of uh, therapy and also age regression therapy for some time, but uh, they have, uh, um, I guess, suppressed it, even from a lot of these elites, such as uh, the Rockefeller that just passed away today. Yeah, didn't he just have a recent heart transplant, like one of the oldest uh, men to receive a heart transplant? and. Yeah, I was just made away. Right. I forgot about that. Passed. Yeah, I forgot about that. That's right. And we really got to watch out for because what do you think about um, Dick Cheney? Dick Cheney, he's had a few uh, heart issues himself. At one point, he called himself Darth Vader. He was he didn't have a pulse, and that was quite interesting. Yeah. People referred to him I, as I Darth Vader. Say, I sort of say he probably didn't have a heart transplant. He just had a heart implant because I doubt he had one before. Um, from what I've heard in the programs, yeah, he's he's a pretty scary individual. Yeah, the, maybe the head of MK Ultra, from what uh, we've heard over the years. Now let's take a big trip. Let's yeah. take a big trip to um, the Antarctica. I saw your presentation last week, and it was mind blowing. And uh, there were some things I've. You just to think you got to think out of the box from the way you were explaining on your uh, your experiences there in the Antarctic. How did you come to even get there and why were you even brought there? What was the whole idea about let's bring Corey Good over to the Antarctic? How did that all work out? Well, I um, through I, I had been introduced several years ago to this, this group that we're calling the Spear Being Alliance. And I had been interfacing with this tall, blue, avian race that in my 20 years in the programs and all of the intruders we had captured and interrogated, I had never, ever heard of an eight-foot-tall blue bird being. And I was pretty concerned when it first started communicating with me. I didn't know what was going on. But through, after, through the process of, of getting to commu- communicating and getting to know these beings, I was introduced to an inner earth group called the Anshar. And this Anshar group took an active interest in me because I was in communication with who they called the guardians. They said, this was the return of the guardians. They were very excited about it. So since I was seen as somewhat of an ambassador, they, and I was working with the secret space program Alliance, who was working to give us full disclosure, this, inner earth group has taken me twice to Antarctica once for a uh, reconnaissance flight over under the ice, about two miles under the ice. There's a huge industrial complex. There were um, buildings all over the place that looked very industrial smoke coming out of them, steam coming out of them, very human looking. And there were giant submarines under the ice that had popped up that were the size of uh, I guess the the giant ships that carry the um, um, the the big shipping containers. It was huge, and I and, and I saw these submarines being unloaded with giant cranes that were reaching in the top that that rolled back and, and pulling out these giant containers. How old was it? Is it was it an ancient civilization and infrastructure built on there, or was it a something from the Nazi uh, era? Well, interestingly enough, there were ancient structures nearby. There were blocks, like hewn blocks, sticking out of the ground, the the earth under the ice, and also from within the ice cavern wall, like they were suspended up in the ice. The actual buildings looked very much like a 20th century or 21st century, um, I guess, area of, I guess, an industrial area, like an industrial complex close to any city or, or, or close to any shoreline. It was, it was very human looking, very modern looking. And uh, in the middle, they had a huge generator that was a geothermal generator that 
generated heat from the earth. And the interesting thing is that there were pools of water around also that were steaming like um, hot, heated hot pools that were heated by geothermal energy. And it turns out that the geothermal energy is picking up at such a high rate in Antarctica, it's causing the ice shelf to heat up by like one degree every year or so, which is causing a rapid melt. And our activities under the ice, both excavating these ancient civilizations using pressurized steam and these facilities we have under there are causing the ice to melt quicker. So this, that was your first trip. What about your second trip to the Antarctica? Was it uh, under the same uh, group that you was, went with the first time? Yes. The Anchar took me a, again and took L- Lieutenant Commander Gonzalez, who's been one of my major contacts with the Secret Space Program Alliance, took us both down to a different region of Antarctica, but they flew right through the ice shelf just like you were passing through regular atmosphere. And I guess there was some way to dematerialize a ship. And then we pop out. In wow. So you're saying the cabin. craft itself, the craft itself is actually traveling through a uh, hard material like ice, like if we're yes, in air. I, in the Anshar city, I saw hundreds of these things flying around above in, in a huge cavern, flying through the cavern walls. So, yeah, they've got some sort of advanced technology that allows them to dematerialize and pass through solid objects. It's, that's uh, – I've never heard of that before. That's quite insane. Is it, is it basically – it's not moving the material as it's going through. It's, it's basically going through it almost through a time and space. Like it, it's not – Yeah, it's like change their vibration. Everything is made of vibration. You know, everything is frequency, and if they're able to, to change the frequency and – rearrange matter in a certain way, I think that, uh, that that's what allows them to pass straight through solid objects. All right. So this Middle Earth, the entrance to Middle Earth, there, is there more than one entrance or is Antarctica pretty much the main, uh, main no, there portal to, you know? Yeah. Most of the entrances are guarded by some sort of a military installation or are in Tibet and are watched over by monks. They, um, they do have large, a large entrance in Antarctica, but it didn't quite go as I expected. When I was on the reconnaissance flight, I thought we were going to shoot back through the, the way we came, but instead we went over this sort of a bay uh, of, of warmer water that was lapping the shores next to this uh, industrial area I saw. And instead of flying in the direction I thought we were, we went straight down the way that these submarines came from. And we ended up entering this large rift system that is the uh, West Antarctic Rift System or something like that. And we went very deep underground and traveled through this rift system that had been tunneled out by some sort of, by some ancient alien race that allowed you to travel from Antarctica all the way up to Central America and the Southern and Southwestern parts of the United States, all completely underwater. This underground, basically, city, you said that was the size of Texas. Like, it had its own ecosystem. It had its own uh, light, warmth. Tell us yes, about what it's city. like to be in a place that big. It just sounds so overwhelming. It was overwhelming. You know when you walk up to a building and you feel like you're going to fall over backwards looking towards the top? It, or, or a giant tree, you know, one of the redwood trees. Imagine that, but you walk out of an, an walk through an entrance into a huge cavern area to where the ceiling is so high you can't even see it because there's a fine mist that it's created like clouds, like a enclosed environment that uh, you know it even rains in there at times. So, so let me um, ask you this. Let me ask you this. There are people that live an everyday life right here on our, you know, above the planet, regular life. Is there enough room in inner earth that we could, as a human race, like go visit other worlds that are with, like, we don't have to go to other planets. It's right up there. We could enter this. Would they allow like maybe a tourism? Would it, would it be possible like a tourist destination one of these days? 
So, you know, some of the areas, yes, definitely. But the, this Anchar group, they really, they're very leery of human beings. When uh, they've contacted us in the past, they always tell us we're from, uh, you know, the Pleiades or something like that. And they do that for operational security because we are such a violent race. They're afraid that if we knew where they were underground, we would attack them, which indeed has happened from some of our black projects groups. So they're not going to invite too many people into their city, but there are plenty of other areas underground that even that we could take refuge in. And after we have full disclosure, I think we're going to have a lot of spelunkers that are also archaeologists that are going to be, you know, traveling to the inner earth. And there's so much to find down there, let alone out in space. Well, yeah, count me in. I want to be, uh, I want to be there. I want to be there and I want to get on that uh, ship that you were on. That sounds incredible. Let's, let's talk about some of the creatures that live in inner earth. You were telling the people over there in the symposium in Kona last week that you, they were talking about a a race of raptors, a race of raptors. And there was a war with uh, soldiers, like military soldiers. Were they American soldiers? What, What was that all about? Well, the raptors are were remnants of the dinosaurs, and they went underground to survive. And they are now – they're sort of a proto-dinosaur bird. They have plumes of feathers on them. They're, they have real jerky movements. They're super fast, and they're carnivorous. So the, the incident that I was talking about that involved um, the Marines was um, – not long ago, after the current president took over, uh, some of the bases that, uh, that were built by FEMA but not controlled by FEMA were supposed to be turned over to the leader of – the new leaders of, of these different groups uh, under the new president. But some of them refused and locked the doors, and Marines were sent in to basically drill holes through these walls, cut through the rebar and steel, steel and go in and arrest these people. And if the people refused to give up, these Marines were ordered to wipe out everyone in the base. And in one of these occasions, they had to go in and they were, they were under orders to wipe everyone out. And in the battle, these uh, Marines were shocked to become face to face with eight foot tall reptilians who were fighting them. And these, these Marines had had zero briefings that ETs even exist, let alone they would run into them and have to do battle with them. So all of a sudden, they're standing there in front of the devil or a demon with the M16 doing battle with them. And I hear that uh, they did not do so well psychologically afterwards. Yeah, post-traumatic stress disorder. Let me, so let me, let me ask you, people theorize that dinosaurs, since they've been around for you know, millions and millions of years, far longer than the human race has existed on planet Earth, that they developed complex languages. Did did these raptors, did they communicate? Were we able to communicate back and forth with them? Well, I, I don't know how they communicate. I, I assume from their physiology, it isn't through a voice box. I assume that it's, uh, you know, some sort of telepathic type of thing, but uh, our military has been in contact with them uh, to get access to certain areas like these giant crystal caves that uh, they took over a long time ago that used to belong to the Anshar, and these giant crystal caves are huge depositories of information. Would, the, would it be the president of the United States that would authorize this uh, combat with this raptor race, or would it be uh, some other general above rank of the president? It would be one of these individuals in the intelligence community that has the clearance that's, you know, 38 levels above the president or somewhere above the president within that 38 levels. Wow. Uh, incredible. So there were other races down there. You were saying they, they look like humans in their own way, different nationalities. You have mm-hmm. a, an Asian looking race, you have an African looking race, and there are uh, Caucasians. What, how do, were they, were they, do they get along down there? Is there a conflict between uh, the races in, in our Earth? Well, a lot of these, these human-type races that you've described, they don't normally meet with each other, but 
you know, they they kind of they kind of stay separated in, unless there's a huge emergency. They claim the Anchar at least claim to have originated be human beings that originated on Earth approximately 18 million years ago. They say that they've been here that long, and that they've been highly developed technologically and had their own breakaway civilization. And that breakaway civilization went underground, and they found that uh, it was a lot safer down there. They it was we they were shielded from the sun, which you know causes a rapid aging and a lot of other things. And they were also isolated away from the ebb and flow of disasters that occur on this planet on a regular cycle. Wow, that's uh, amazing. So, what would you prefer to live in? Uh, up here on the surface of the earth or in our earth? What, what do you, what would you prefer if, if they you offered, really had a choice? If, if they offered my family and I a condo down in that Anshar city, I'd, you would, I would disappear in a heartbeat. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah. It sounds fascinating. The, it was magnificent. So is there a danger? Is there a danger that uh, we might just do something stupid because we don't trust what's going on in there and, would there be a possibility of like maybe a nuclear event or they're pretty much, do they have security? Can they defend themselves in case of yes, an invasion they, they by a, some tyrant? Yes, they can. And they've, they've been doing battle like with the Raptors for quite some time and a couple of other groups. But interestingly enough, since on the surface we've developed, developed these scalar weapons we can penetrate deep, deep, like 40 miles into the ground. And that has become a major, um, I guess, threat to them because it has been used on some of their facilities. Some of these groups, they're looking to take out all the negative ET underground facilities, which there are many. But in doing so, they don't differentiate. They find an underground base. It isn't ours. So they attack it uh, remotely with this technology. Wow, and it's, let's. What about this? Have you have you left planet Earth? Have you been a, in space? Yes, I was uh, assigned to um, the uh, research vessel they called the Sommerfeld. That uh, I was I was assigned to that for 19 years. Even though I was sent on other expeditions and missions, my um, my assignment was to this research vessel. And the, the research vessel, we spent time, a lot of time around Jupiter. We spent time um, around, uh, they even did studies of the sun where they were shooting probes into the um, uh, dark spots, the little eddies on the sun, and uh, to, to penetrate the sun to get more information about it. And, and, and they were able to prove that it's an electroplasmic um, sun. It's not, you know, it's not a giant hydrogen uh, generator or whatever and uh, you know the the fact that our universe the physics model that is used in these black programs is an, an electric plasmic universe model the fact that that's been suppressed from surface humanity that's what's not allowed surface humanity to develop a lot of these you know very interesting technologies to like such as free energy or anti-gravity once we are taught the true physics and we understand that everything is electric plasmic, then we will adopt a new mathematics model and we'll be able to build these things very easily. What was the ship like? What, what did the ship, did it launch from a, a regular launching facility like Cape Canaveral or was it a secret mission? Well, and it was originally built, was the ship. Yeah, it was originally built in the, early 80s, early, early 80s in a location, a secret location under the mountains in Utah. And then they were flown into space and then they are, uh, personnel are brought there in smaller craft. Now, this, um, this particular craft was, um, and they're very much like a nuclear submarine, a, fl a nuclear submarine in space. As a matter of fact, a lot of the people that serve on them are what they call squids or uh, are either current Navy uh, submarine personnel or used to be uh, Navy uh, submarine personnel. 
So it's basically no different than being in a submarine, a very large submarine that's modular, just like the new um, the submarine, the nuclear submarines. And you know, it, ha uh, it had a uh, crew of that went from anywhere from like 260 or 70 to over you know 300 people, which you know they have naval vessels that are much larger than that. And some of the and it was cigar shaped. And some of the larger cigar shaped vessels are up to a kilometer long, if you can imagine that. Wow, wow. It um, sounds like an adventure that if you were, if your life was done now, you would have already completed any more than most people could ever dream. So that's, you, you could walk away and think to yourself, that's the, that's a, that's a testament. Yeah, my bro my brother's interrupting me, but yeah, what a testament. Uh -huh. What about uh, when you went on to the – did you get to the dark side of the moon? What's going on over there? Did, did oh, you get yeah. To yeah, that's – the, the yep. Lunar Operation Command um, is on the dark side of the moon at about the 10 o'clock position uh, just on the other side. Uh, sometimes you'll uh, – videos have popped out of you know, a flurry of uh, craft flying away out of that area. And it's, um, it was originally set up, believe it or not, in the 1940s by the Nazis, who had developed their own secret space program and had flying saucers that they were flying outside of our atmosphere that early in our history. And they developed a uh, – they set up a, a base there that at one time it looked – it was shaped like a swastika, the, the way they did the buildings. After, wow. do, after, do you think it was yeah. a, a ahead. Perp, was it done purposeful the according Absolutely. to Hitler's yeah. design? Yes, it, the swastika uh, sh uh, shape of the building was on purpose. After the Americans, um, the, the basically the Germans infiltrated the military industrial complex of the United States through paperclip, and then after these negotiations that occurred in 1952, after the Nazis overflew the White House and, and, and D.C., that forced you know, Truman and Eisenhower to come to the table with them and uh, discuss a partnership because the Germans knew that the highest secret in the land was the E.T. phenomenon. And it's not because they didn't want people to know about E.T.s. It's because they didn't want people to know about the free energy that powered them. So once uh, they had infiltrated the military industrial complex, basically took over and won the war post-war basically, then this new military industrial complex space program began to utilize the Lunar Operation Command, the, this uh, base on the moon, and they built it out. And as they built it out, they purposely removed the shape of a swastika from the uh, way the buildings were organized. Elon Musk has been paid basically approximately a hundred million dollars to fly a couple billionaires around the moon. Uh, apparently in the next couple of years, when they're on their adventure, I'm sure they're going to be going around the dark side of the moon. How are they going to, yes. how are they going to suppress it? Do you think they're going to reveal what's on the dark side of the moon? These billionaires, well, I'm sure they, they want to find out for themselves. They could. Uh, most of these secret bases, both the non-terrestrial ones and the human ones, are masked by using this holographic technology. What is not masked, however, are some of the ancient ruins up there and crashed vehicles. Apparently, there was an ancient war that occurred in our solar system, and the moon ended up being kind of like a Switzerland area. I mean, it was it's uh, no battles are allowed to occur on it, and they left. It, I mean, you have non-terrestrial groups that can't stand each other, have been at war for millennia, that are just a few kilometers away from each other on the moon, but they never fight. And because of this big treaty that occurred. Now, this um, they left a lot of these crashed ships and other debris on the backside of the moon as a testament to remind the other groups how terrible this war was. You know, the Star, the Star Wars, the, sure, the Star Wars story is basically true. It just it did not happen 
long, long ago and far, far in a galaxy far, far away. It happened. Most of it happened in our own solar system. And it's happening right now. Yeah. Yes. That's a. Uh... It's incredible. I just when is disclosure going to happen? Is there any way that you could provide any kind of evidence that we could just just blow the lid off everything and you know do something to get things rolling? Because your experience, I'm jealous, man. A lot of people want to experience the same thing and not have to go through these my lab uh, programs. Yeah, yeah. I have people all the time contact me and saying, "How do I join this program?" And I'm I'm like, have you listened to anything I said? <laughs> it's dark. You know, there's dark stuff going on. There's a uh, human slave trade, uh, intergalact- uh, interstellar human slave trade going on to where, um, you know, for a long time, these non-terrestrials were coming down and, and scooping up humans and, and then taking off with them. And um, finally, these Illuminati type groups said, wait a minute, that means they want humans. So humans are a commodity. So they began trading people for technology and other biological information from other star systems so that they could use for their studies. So, you know, nearly a million people go missing every year, and a good portion of them end up being traded off as slaves or worse in this intergalactic slave trade or interstellar slave trade. Now, that's, that's kind of scary. I it have is. to say, because and there are uh, there are millions of people around the world that say they've been abducted every year, and uh, uh, a lot of them, unfortunate ones, are never to be seen again. Yeah. Well, when it comes to full disclosure, if we get a full disclosure event, a lot of people that listen to the show might be saying that would be great. It'd be a big kumbaya moment. We'll all hold hands and you know sing a song, but. Disclosure, if we get full disclosure, it's going to be one of the most traumatic events that ever happened to humanity. But it's needed because all evolution happens in stress. A lot of these groups right now are working on a partial disclosure to where they will unroll disclosure over 50 to 100 years. They want to make sure that many of them have a chance to die because so many crimes against humanity have been committed just to keep the secret alone. So it's disclosure is a very, you know, is, is a very shaky subject, and a lot of people just don't know how to do it. They don't know how to do it. Yeah. Um, well, little by little, you know, soft baby steps in the beginning, but give us a little bit, and then a little bit more. I guess they're doing it a little through technology, because technology seems like uh, they are trickling down some of the information that they have in their. Uh, in their archive. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. They've, they've been this slow release of information and planting seeds in our consciousness about the aliens and, and the secret space programs has been going on for quite a while, going all the way back to the, you know, star, uh, star Trek when it came out, with Gene Roddenberry, you know, Gene Roddenberry had close connections with the son of a major admiral according to Dr. Sala's research, that was involved with Solar Warden. So he had a direct contact with, with people that were in the U.S. Secret Space Program. Yeah, Michael Sala, he does a uh, good work, and I want to be t- uh, touching base with him real soon. But, you know, the show's just about done, but that just flew by so fast, so much information. We want to invite you back sometime in the near future. I'm, I'm sure we just touched the tip of the iceberg with uh, the experiences that you've been uh, on, and you probably uh, could probably go on for days talking about this. But can you please yeah. tell us how – people could find you and what are you going to be doing next? And is there any message that you've received from any of these, uh, alien races that we should be aware of? Well, uh, I can be reached at sphere I also have a YouTube channel sphere being alliance. And, um, the, you know, these, um, a lot of these, uh, non-terrestrial groups are, are very positive, but you know, we do have the negative ones and a lot of people don't want to believe that. And, uh, you know, we have to be mentally prepared for such a thing. 
And you know, I and I'll be happy to come back on your show because yes, we have plenty to talk about. And Dr. Sala is about to release three more articles. He released one today that are going to cover a lot of intelligence that I, I briefed him on uh, on the, the 16th of this month while I was there in Hawaii. Absolutely, absolutely. That was uh, that was incredible. Uh, just it makes me think and it makes me think along uh, many hours after this conversation and what i heard last week from what uh, Corey goods just told us everybody take a look at the sphere being alliance all the links will below be below in the description stay tuned and uh, keep in touch with Corey good on his youtube channel because uh, he's coming up with updates quite often that was Corey good everybody and if you've captured anything quite amazing in the skies something on video that you can't explain submit it to us right here at third phase of moon Wow, incredible story, incredible uh, insight and information. We'll see everybody again next time. Blake Cousins, Third Phase of Moon.